speak to us today. We appreciate you because you're kind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First, I have to say thank you for that last song. That last song was, you know, when we were young and you, you considered yourself a good Christian, you listened to those kind of songs. <laughs> it's a fantastic song and I bless God for that. Um, today I'm speaking on something called Knowing Jesus. Um, I mean, I'm going to say quite a few things and it might be a lot of rumbling here and there. But whatever you do, please let something stay with you to make a decision to know God personally. We live in a generation where people, people go to church, people listen to pastors, people read books, people do all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, the thing that will make the difference is a decision to know God personally. You know? I'm going to start with a song. I don't know how many of you remember this song. Um, it's called Knowing You. And, you know, it's, um, I remember I was in uni when this song came out, Graham Hendricks, in the early 90s. He said, let me just read some of the words. He said, all I've once had there and built my life upon. All these words reverse and look wars to home. All the things I thought I gained have now counted less. Spent and worthless. Now compared to this. And what is he comparing to? Knowing you. Said so knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. There is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, you're my righteousness, and I love you. You know, said like knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. It's it's critical. You know, and so that's why I said, whatever I say today, um, you do, forget what I say, but just make that decision to know God personally. It's critical. All right, next slide, please. Oops, thank you, sir. You see, I told you it's gone, it's gone, it's gone very, it's gone very techy. Okay, I want to start very quickly because my time is fast spent. I'm going to start with Numbers 12, and I want us to just read Numbers 12 and just pick something quickly from Numbers 12, uh, 12 verses 1 to 10. If you have some of the scriptures as I call them, you can read uh, so that I can make this quick. Now, Miriam, Miriam and Abraham began, and oh, I'll take that again, Miriam, and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of the Cushite wife he had married. And the Lord spoke only through, has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked. Has he also spoken through us? Now Moses was a very humble man, and more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Verse 4. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, said, Come out of the tent of meeting, all three of you. And the three of them went out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. <coughs> when the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my word. When there is a prophet of the Lord among you, I reveal myself to them in visions, and I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. Let me read that again. When there is a prophet of the Lord among you, I reveal myself to that prophet in vision and in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant? Hallelujah. See the clear distinction that the Lord makes between Moses and other people. Yeah? He said, when there's a prophet, I speak to them in visions and dreams. But with Moses, it is different. I speak to him face to face like a man speaks to his friend. Hallelujah. I read again uh, Micah 6 8. Those are just my opening scriptures. Uh, those are just the opening scriptures. Let's just read Micah 6 8 very quickly and then we'll go into the word. Hallelujah. Micah 6 8. If you have it, you can read it, please. Micah 6 8. Micah 6 8, one of the minor prophets. Micah 6 8. Yes, please. I have shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. To, to show mercy and to walk humbly with your God. When he says walk, Amos 3 says something, he said, can two walk together unless they agree? So when he says walk there, he's talking about a connotation, he's talking about a relationship. 
Hallelujah. So, central truths. What are the central truths? Knowing the Lord is a personal journey. This is the first central truth that we must hold on. You see? He said, don't judge other people's relationship with God based on your own limited experience of God. The way God deals with people is different. It differs from person to person. So he said, knowing God is a personal journey. This is the first central truth. The second central truth is this. People who know God personally have a milestone or marker on the, on the road of their relationship with God. You know, there are people, you know, you tell them, how do you know God answers you? They will tell you on so-so-so and so, 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 and so they I had this issue. I called out to God and God gave me a revelation. God told me something. He might not even come in a woozy-woozy thing. It might just be that in the depth of the night, when there was nobody else to help you, you asked God for something. And he spoke, so, he spoke the peace to your heart. You don't even have the thing. But he just gave you the peace that you needed. Do you understand? So people who know God personally, they have those milestones. They have those markers on the road on their faith. Number three, even in the time of law, knowing God was marked by personal relationship. And, you know, this is what surprises me. When we thought about the law of Moses and the Old Testament, people think that once you do something wrong, God was going to strike you dead. Actually, it's not true. There were people who had exceptions because they had a personal relationship with God. You know, all through the scriptures, even in the Old Testament times, and we'll see that as we go through this, this message. All right. So, introduction, legalistic arguments. Many times we get into arguments about knowing God. Usually, we have this problem because we understand God through the experiences of other people. You know, I was saying something about we should do church like this more. And Brad was saying, ah, it's because of the time. No. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. You see, what a church like this gives us is that we get God from a different perspective. Everybody is able to build their faith at their own speed. It would have been different if we had a pastor. There's nothing wrong with having a pastor. Do you understand? But we, in this day and age, we tend to follow super people, you know, so we have a super pastor, we have a super leader, we have a this, that, that, that. And that person might be great, but he's at a far higher level and he's not able to bring some other people who are at low level. The advantage of having a fellowship like we have is that everybody is able to develop at their own pace. There are too many people in the world today who are living faith through the faith of other people. <laughs> I come from Nigeria and you know, it's not uncommon for people to say, my pastor said, my bishop said, this, that, 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 that. Now, the question is, what did God say? What God says doesn't matter. It's what the pastor says that matter. It's what the bishop says that matters. We need to be able to trim those things off of our life. So that's why I said, we need to understand understanding God through our own experience rather than the experience of other people. Some other people use the example of holy men from the scriptures. Moses, David, Paul. Now again, these are great people. They are examples of faith for us. But they are examples of faith for us because they have their own personal relationships with God. Do you understand? Now, I like something that uh, Paul, Apostle Paul said. He said, when he became a Christian, I did not go to sit down with any of the other apostles. He said, rather, he went into the desert and the Lord taught him personally. Do you understand? If you read that scripture, he said, I went in and the Lord taught me. It was only after he had learned that he came out and he met other apostles. So that he doesn't pick up the biases of other people before he had gotten to know God. Do you understand? He got to know God first. Then he compared what he knows with other people. And you see that scripture again with Apollos. Do you understand? There were, Priscilla and Aquila were saying something about Apollos. He said when they met him, he was a good speaker. Do you understand? He was already a good speaker. He knew the fact. But there were some things that were not perfect about him. So they, they trim off the edges. But the core of his faith was the core of his faith. Because he already knew God personally. Do you understand? So again, I'm saying that, yes, it's great to have the example of the holy man from scripture. But get your own faith first. Get an understanding of God first. Now... People also, I said, thirdly, we box God by saying we can only serve him through his great servants. So, all right. So, again, I think the point is made. So, let me move on to the next thing. Okay. So, God himself is also searching for people to know him personally. 
Look at what Daniel 11.32 said. He said that the people who know the Lord, they are God. And I like the way the scripture puts it there. He said, they know the Lord, they are God. Now, the there, there, it's a possessive noun, isn't it? It's something that is personal. He said, those who know the Lord, they are God, shall be strong and they shall do exploits. He said, look at how God boasted, had a boast on Moses. It was a personal friendship. That Numbers 12 that we read. Let me read it again. Because I want, he said, when there's a prophet, he said, I speak to them in visions and in dreams. He said, but with my servant Moses, it is not so. I speak to him face to face like a man who speak to his friend. Hallelujah. Okay. But the reason that this is also like this is because Moses himself had a desire to know God first. So let's go and look at Exodus 33, 11. Let's go and look at Exodus 33, 11. If you read, if you see it, you can read. Um, okay. So I'm reading from the NIV. Um, Exodus 33, verse 11. Okay. And the Lord will speak to Moses face to face as one will speak to his friend. Then Moses will return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. And Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead this people, but you have not. Let me know who you are and who you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and, have, and you have found favor with me. Verse 13. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember, this nation is your people. Let me read verse 13 again. If you are pleased with me, teach me to know that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. So, now, it's not that God just loved Moses or spoke to Moses. It was because Moses had that desire first. Okay. So, Abraham, Job, and other patriarchs also had that same relationship. You understand? If you look at, look at Abraham, look at what God said about him, about the relationship he had with God. Look at Job. Look at Job. Somebody, his children will go for parties and all of that. He didn't go to the party. But he was afraid that they might offend God. It's, it's a fear of God. Do you understand? It's a commitment to God to be sure that you are in right standing. You already had a relationship. You don't want other people or other things to ruin that relationship that you have with God. Do you understand? The Bible will say something about Jesus himself. He said in the cool of the evening, after all the preaching and all of that, he will withdraw himself. Do you understand? To recharge his battery. Do you understand? To get into that personal relationship back with God. So, the examples are bound in the scriptures. Now, so, so I said, looking at this select example of Moses, Abraham, Job, I was able to see a few characteristics. Just a few things. First thing, sincerity. Do you understand? Moses genuinely desired to be God's friend. We read that in that Exodus 33. There was a desire in his heart. They may not be perfect people. Part of the problem is that we are looking for perfect people. They may not be perfect people, but they, at least they had the sincerity to love God genuinely. This was the first thing I found. Number two, humility. The scripture said something. It said Moses was the most humble man. <laughs> Do you understand? He was the most humble man in scripture. The humility, it's unbelievable how Christians... If you listen to some pastors on TV, you'll be, you'll be scared. You'll be scared for them. Do you understand? Some of us, and I'm not criticizing pastors, because we're all the same, all of us. But at least we need to keep some things, particularly when we deal with God. We need to be, we need to put ourselves in a position. He's so far above us. You know, you cannot have a relationship with God without being humble. You need to be able to show vulnerability. <laughs> I know that he's way ahead of you. He's way ahead of you. He knows much, much, much better than you do. So, so humility is another thing. Number three, trust and complete faith. Do you understand? You know, I was thinking about, we've all heard about this Abraham story. But let me leave Abraham out of it. I was listening to this song, the song that we sang, I mean, that I read the words in the beginning. He said, now everything I've, I've, I've counted, that I counted gain, I now consider lost. 
There are some songs that we sing, but we just sing them. Think about it. Because basically what he's telling you is that, oh, do I consider my marriage? Do I consider my child? Do I consider my car, my home? Do you understand? And to be honest, you will know that you are not at a stage in certain situations. But God is patient. He will allow you to get there at your own time. But at least acknowledge first and foremost that you are not there. Those things are critical. You have to be able to trust the Lord and have faith. That faith is critical. The ability to trust Him implicitly and completely. Yeah? Then the fear of God. Look at the fear of God that Job had. I love, I love something about God. You know, he said the Lord is sovereign. Absolutely. And the Lord can do anything. And people like Job knew that. And in knowing that, he knows that it's maybe it's not enough for me to be in right standing. It was also good that my children are in right standing. God said something about Joshua. He said, oh, no, no, no. It wasn't about Joshua, actually. I think you, I don't remember who God said this about in the scripture. He said, but I know he will ordain his children after him. He will order his children after him. Oh, yeah? Do you understand? So it wasn't good enough that this guy was in right standing. It was also important that his children was in right standing. Yeah? And that was exactly what Job was doing. Because he knew that the Lord had already given this law. Do you understand? He feared the Lord enough to be able to say that it's not only that I will be in right standing, my family also will be in right standing. The list is not exhausting. But the other thing that I will say to you is this. Note that all these different men have different strengths. Do you understand? Some of them trusted God. Some of them had faith. Some of them feared God. Yeah? But all of their different characteristics, all of the different things that they did, led to one thing, a good relationship with God. And what that tells me is this. We all have different things. Similarly, for all of us, there might be different things that we do right that will give us relationship with God. Do you understand? God deals with us in different relationships. Do you see what I mean? Do you know, there might be people here who are just worshippers. Their life is not perfect, but they are worshippers. They, they know how to worship God. That's, and that's the basis of their friendship with God. There's somebody else whose life is that he trusts God. There's somebody else whose life is that they are able to preach their evangelize. Do you understand? People have different strengths. All of those strengths build them up in a friendship, in a relationship with God. I'll give you an example. Somebody was, my pastor, the pastor of the church I attend in London once said something. He said, if I give you an example, if your child went to school, this term, and it's called 90-90-90 in four subjects out of five, and then on the last subject it's called 50. When that child comes home at the end of that term, what are you going to work on? The subject that the child had 50, right? So that you can strengthen that child in the 50. But you're wrong. Yeah? You will only, no matter how much work you do, that child will probably just become 70 or 80 in that 50. The child who is on a 90, if you work on the 90, you have the capacity to go to 100 on that. that. This is psychology. Unfortunately, most of us get it wrong, not only in the physical, but also in the spiritual. Do you understand? We need to work on our strengths, on the areas where we are strongest, rather than focus on our weaknesses too much. Rather than put too much focus on our weaknesses, we should focus on where we are strong. So if your life is that you are a strong worshiper, focus on your worship and build your relationship with God in the area of worship, and then let that bring other areas of your life up with God. Do you understand? This is the point I'm trying to make. Okay, so again, I, I put that in red, and I said we all have different relationships with God, and God has a different relationship with each of us. But no matter what the area of your relationship is, it's that relationship, that connection that you have, that is going to bring other areas of your life up with God. Hallelujah. Okay, and like I said, and so, and this is also not different with us physically. Do you understand? If you look at parents as you know, God nurtures us as our parents nurture different children. If we went to the same, it's not uncommon to go to a house where they have three or four kids, and these kids will be as different as light as day, right? 
the parents deal with those children according to how their emotions are, how things are with those specific children. With every child, you not know to every child according to the characteristic of that child. And that's exactly what God does with us. Yeah? So, see, he said, no, God is fair. It's not that God is not unfair, because somebody now can then ask me, look, Adi, are you saying that the standard of God is different? No, the standard of God is the same, and the standard of God is, is always fair and just. But the truth of the matter is that, nonetheless, God deals with us and nurtures us in the way in which we are related with them. Okay. So, I said, like any household, family rules are the same, but the children who breach the rules from time to time are corrected or nurtured in different ways. I come from an African background. They smack us when we're kids. Well, I mean, do you understand? I, guess I got smacked. There's no question about that. <laughs> but I got smacked a lot, actually, because I was a bit naughty. <laughs> yeah, but, but you see, it's not only, it's not only that but as much as I got smart, my younger sister never got smart in her house. Never. Never. They just nurtured every child, you know, the way a child was going to be raised. And that's exactly what God does with us. Okay. Next slide. I mean, next, uh, next word. I said, now note that all Christians don't suffer the same consequences for the same offense. You need to know how God deals with you personally. You may get away with something that others do not get away with, and vice versa. You know, when I got, when this thing occurred to me, it makes, it should make you fair. Because, brother, I may get away with something and I will not get away with it. I will get away with something that Brankelichi will not get away with. It's, it's, it's the way God has, has ordained things to be for us. And I'll show you a few examples. Let's, let's look at one or two examples. So I said, let's look at the example of these seeming inconsistencies from the scripture. Let's return to that uh, central scripture today of Moses and try and evaluate what really happened there. So now, if you look at Moses, it was Moses who married a Koshite wife, right? And this was wrong according to the law. So, actually, Miriam and Aaron had a basis to actually accuse Moses. They had a legal standing. Do you see what I mean? They had a legal ground to accuse Moses. But God never rebuked Moses. Have you ever seen anywhere in the scripture where God said, Moses, you married this woman, and I told you not to marry these people? It's not in the scripture. If you go to Ezra and Nehemiah, people actually got killed for marrying people from different tribes. That's how serious it was. It was a serious offense. But because it was a different relationship that Moses had, he got away with it. Now, there was other things that everybody else, I mean, people complained and murmured for years. You know, and God allowed them to, God didn't say anything. The day that Moses complained once, I mean, have you ever thought about why Moses missed the promised land? It, it seems so innocuous. <laughs> Every day I think about it, goodness me. This guy missed promised land because he just said this. That's, that's all he did. Do you understand? His relationship was different. People mourned for years, for 40 years. They kept going around. But the day Moses did it, that was it for him. So the relationships determine your consequences. Let's look at another example. If you look at the example of David, Azekiah, Amaziah, if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 24, let's, okay, let's, let's look at that one. Let's just look at that one so that, um, yeah, let's look at that one quickly. 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 okay, Samuel. If, please, if you see, you can read. 2 Samuel 24. 1 to 4. Yes, sir. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go. Said to prepare the captain of the host which was with him. Go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number into the people that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord thy God hath unto thee the people, how many soever they be, a hundredfold, and that the eyes of my Lord the king may see it, but why doth my Lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding the king's word prevailed against him, and again the captains of the host. 
and dwelt and the captains of the host went out of the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And obviously, you remember the consequences of this activity. Do you understand? Almost immediately, the Lord called out David for this. Do you understand? And he gave him three options of punishment. Yeah? Three, you know? Immediately, there was consequences for this. Then, you know, this, this, day, uh, this month, I'm studying the book of Second Chronicles. And I was reading about Amaziah, who was a king also in Israel. And he did exactly the same thing. If you go to Second Chronicles 25, 5 to 10, let me just read Second Chronicles 25, 5 to 10 for you. <laughs> so Amaziah called the people of Judah together and assigned according to their families and them to commanders of thousands and hundreds and all of Judah and Benjamin. Then he mustered everybody who was 20 years old or more, and he found that there were 300,000 men fit for military service, able to handle the spear and shield. He also hired a hundred thousand men from Israel for the for the price of a hundred talents of silver. But the man of God came to him and said, Your Majesty, these troops from Israel must not match with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, not with any other people of Ephraim. Even if you go to fight with these people, God will overthrow you before your enemies. So Amaziah asked the man of God, But what about the hundred thousand hundred talents I paid for these troops? And the man of God replied, The God can give you much more than that. So Amaziah dismissed the troops who had come from Ephraim and sent them home. He did the same thing. He counted the people. He went a step further. He even hired more people. But even in doing that, God didn't stop him. God sent somebody to warn him to say that was not good. Do you understand? And after he said it was not good, the guy listened to God and that was the end of it. Meanwhile, in David's case, 70,000 people had died. 70,000 people. I mean, every time I read that scripture, it, it makes God very obvious to you. He said David was standing on an open field and he saw an angel with a sword in his hand who was slaying people. And when he begged him, please stop, at the point where he stopped, he built an altar. What I'm saying is that look at the consequence for the same offense between David and Amaziah. As, as far as light is from day, do you see what I mean? 70,000 people on one hand, the other one, God just told him, don't do it. And the guy didn't do it, and that was the end of it. So, so, so I go back to the point I'm making. The cons it's not inconsistency, it is relationship. Okay. Now, so, okay. And I said, again, you will see a lot of flexibility throughout the scripture. One last example before we move away from this. When you get home, please try and read Second Chronicles 29 and 30. The prayer of um, Ezekiah. How Ezekiah was preparing for the Passover. If there's anything that follows the law in the Old Testament, it was the Passover. It was the priest who had to kill the meat, how they were going to skin it and all of that. Ezekiah restored temple worship after it had been stopped for a long time. But they didn't have enough priests, they didn't have enough Levites to do the work. He got people to do the work. Do you understand? They just got people, they concentrated them, consecrated them, and they did the work the way they, they saw fit. Do you know? And God, and God forgave them and allowed it. If you look at the early church, the council in Jerusalem, what did Acts 15 say? They said, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So it showed that it wasn't, it wasn't a law, it wasn't something fixed. It was just something that they were okay with, and they said it to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gave them light, and that was it. And the Holy Spirit gave them light based on relationship. Okay. Hallelujah. So I asked myself the question, why do we persist with rules? Why do we persist with doctrines when we have an easier option? An easier option that is based on relationship. The thing is that rules are easier to follow. We can relate to them. They are clear. Do you understand? This, this is the only reason why we do it. Secondly, it helps us to fulfill our own self-righteousness. You know, you've met people, somebody said to me, well, this year we are fasting for a hundred days. Have you met that? Yeah, we are fasting for a hundred days this year. I'm <laughs> you know, it makes us feel righteous, doesn't it? And sometimes, this is where we have these problems. Now, and most importantly, the rules appear righteous. 
they make us feel like we're righteous. We're doing the right thing. Like I said at the start, forget the rules. If you don't get anything, just know that I need to get a personal relationship with God. It's key. All right. Okay. But I'm not only talking about rules, do you understand, from the whole testament. I'm also talking about doctrines of today's church. Now let's look at second Cor uh, um, let's look at Colossians. Please let's this is the last scripture I'll read so that I don't take it. Let's just look at sec uh, Colossians 2, 16, 20 to 23. Colossians 2, 16, then jump to verse 20 to 23. If you have it, please just read it. Yes, please. Let's go. Let me have the majority in meat or in drink or in respect of the holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. 23. Yes, sir. 20. 20 to 23. 20 to 23. Yes, sir. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why are you living in the world? Are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, test not, handle not. Which all are to perish with the usage after the commandments and doctrines of men? Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship <coughs> and neglecting of the body, not in any honor, but the satisfying of the flesh? Amen. Thank you, sir. I just read that 23 again. So it says, such regulations have an appearance of wisdom, and they and with their self-imposed worship, they are forced false humility and a harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So watch your ego, any appearance of spiritual um, superiority over others. He said, make room for the fault of others because God is dealing with them in a different way from you. Yeah? Romans 14, 1 to 4 says something. He said, who are you to judge another man's servant? Do you understand? So always keep that in mind. On the other hand, also watch out for the error of freedom. You know, we, we talk about rules and doctrines on one hand. There's also the error of freedom. Oh, we're free to do anything. We can, no, we're not. Sorry, we're not. I, I know we like to be, but no, we're not. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 23, 24, he said, not everything is beneficial for you. I'm permitted to do everything, but not everything is beneficial. So, on one hand, we must watch out for doctrines and law, but on the other hand, you must also watch out for too much freedom. Yeah? Okay. Hallelujah. All right. So what do we need to do? The way to attain this level of relationship with God, Psalm 51 says, it is not, the Lord does not desire sacrifice. He desires a broken spirit. It is a spirit that is vulnerable, that is humble to the Lord. So let us return to the fruit of the spirits. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Simplicity, simplicity, humility, brotherly love, and faith in God. You know, whatever you know is your strength with God, build on it. Pick the one that you know that it's your strength in God and build on that one. And then all the other things will come up with you. The important thing is that you have the connection first, everything else will follow. Hallelujah. For me, I'll use a personal example, my own personal example. I mean, if you know me in the office, uh, people know me. I talk a lot. Uh, yes, I talk. I get, uh, and I can get very agitated as well, um, you know. But what I know, my personal, in my own personal work with God, what I've come to understand, there are three or four key things for me. First, the Lord, the King, the Lord is a King for me who is worshipped. The Lord is absolutely sovereign. Whatever the Lord decides, you must learn, at least I've learned to accept it. I may not agree with it, but you have to accept it. It's a sovereign law. I cannot question it. Yeah, at least personally, that's me. Secondly, the Lord, I know that the Lord wants me to be sincere and vulnerable and dependent on him. That's my own personal experience. And it's a Lord who has always met my need. I, I, I mean, I've been, I've I've left school now for 20 years, and I've never been out of work for one day, never. And I've changed work a lot, you know? And God, God has always met the need. So at least I know the places where God has met me. Do you understand? And I encourage you, please know where God meets you. That's, that's all I will say. So find your own place in God. Ask yourself, 
who is God to me? What have you learned on your personal road with God? What is God calling you to do? Remember that your call is an individual call. Yes, it's an individual call. We will fit together to build the entire church, but you must have your own individual call. Do you understand? It's like a marriage. If no matter how good your spouse is, if you are not satisfied with yourself, your marriage cannot work. You have to do, you have to be comfortable in your own skin first, with who you are first, before you can bring that into another person's life. So it's like that. Remember your call is individual first. Find your place in God. Yeah.